Hi there, this is Professor Shannon Gracie from Maricosta College. We'll be covering 3.1 from the Larson and Edwards calculus text today, which covers extrema on an interval. So go ahead and um, open up your notebook. If you do not have the notebook, you can go to www.mathchick.net to download it for free. And you can follow along or just check out the examples if you need a little help. So ready, here we go. Let's uh, go ahead and warm up. Our goals are listed above. And right now we wanna determine the pointer points at which the graph of f at x equal to two x squared minus eight x plus five has a horizontal tangent. All right, well, let's see how you did. Now, depending on how you're looking at this function, you may recognize that it is a quadratic function, and a quadratic function is going to have a vertex, which will represent the minimum or maximum of the function. So what happens is, if the parabola opens upward, you'll have a good, a minimum value, and if it opens downward, you'll have a maximum value. Let's clear this stuff out. Go to y equals and clear and clear. Okay, so uh, let's see. So let, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna graph this guy. I know I'm going a little bit beyond what you might've done for this problem, but we might as well use it as a learning opportunity. So we've got two x squared minus eight x's plus five is our function. Let's go ahead and um, graph the derivative function. So if you remember, you go to uh, math and you go down to n deriv. If you have an older calculator, this might look a bit different. Um, it'll just have n deriv and you might have to put, um, you're gonna have to put um, it's basically the same steps, um, but you might have to check the step-by-step -step examples that I have a link to on the website. It's uh, links for keystroke examples for the TI calculators. So DDX, and we wanna do of our Y1, so we'll do VARs, Y VARs, enter, enter. And um, we want to do all of X, so we'll say X is X. Good so far? All right, so let's go ahead and uh, graph this. I'm gonna do a standard zoom first of all, and then we'll see where we're at. This looks good. Okay. So let's go ahead and uh, get a picture of this guy. Now, what does it mean to have a horizontal tangent? It means that the slope of the graph will be zero at that point. So if you recall, this green graph here is f prime at x, and we'll find out what that equals. And the blue graph is our f at x, which is, you know, the 2x squared, minus 8x plus 5. So let's go ahead and find out what exactly this derivative function is, right? So we have our f at x is equal to 2x squared minus 8x plus 5. If we ah, differentiate both sides with respect to x, we will have f prime at x on the left side, and then on the right side, good. It's going to be 4x minus 8. Now, we wanted to find the zeros of this derivative function. So if we set this guy equal to 0 and solve, we will get um, 8 is equal to 4x. So x is equal to 2. And notice that we have an ordered pair. So this, this function here is the line, whoops, 
4x minus 8. And we have an ordered pair right here at 2, 0 for the derivative graph. And notice if you look down here at this, at this ordered pair, which is at the vertex, do you see that you would have a horizontal tangent line right there? Okay, so this is really a key concept of what we're going to be learning um, through from really from three one to three six. So you want to make sure that you um, you really do the homework consistently, and you do each section um, you do each section problem sets from each section right after you do the video if possible. All right, um, and don't do them all right before the exam because then you might blank out. Now, are we done with this problem, or is there something else we need to do? Okay, so we, you're right. We need to find the ordered pair where this occurs. So the ordered pair where this occurs will be at f at 2. And f at 2 is going to be 2 times 2 squared minus 8 times 2 plus 5. So I, all I did here was um, n for x on the original function, I put a 2 to figure out where on the original function that ordered pair would be. So f at 2 is going to be, let's see, 2 squared is 4, so we'll have 8 minus minus 16 is negative 8 plus 5 is negative 3. So this ordered pair here where the horizontal tangent occurs on the original function is at the ordered pair 2, negative 3. Okay? So let's answer the question um, in words at the point 2, negative 3 f will have a horizontal tangent. Okay? Awesome. So, going into extrema of a function. So, in calculus, much effort is devoted to determine the behavior of a function f on an interval i, right? Does f have a maximum value or a minimum value? On this interval, where is f increasing? Where is f decreasing? In this chapter, you will learn how differentiation can be used to answer these questions. Right? And this, in turn, will aid us in sketching the graph by hand. All right, so here we go. Definition of extrema. Right? So extremum is the singular, right? Singular. Extrema is plural. So f is defined on some open interval i that contains the domain value c. So f at c is the minimum of f on this interval if the y values at f at c are less than or equal to any all the other y values for all of the domain values in i. Okay, And again, it, the function value is the maximum if at x is c if you know, that's the largest y value in the interval for all these input values. So here there's different wording that you can use, and you've explored this a little bit in pre-calc. We'll be getting to some, some examples. But um, if you look back at our warm-up problem, we had ascertained that we had a minimum, right? So uh, there is or instead of there is, we should say the minimum 
is negative 3. and is located at that ordered pair to negative 3. So, you know, the, when they're, you're asked what is the minimum or maximum, it's going to be the y value. If you're asked where it's located, it's going to be the ordered pair. Um, other words for minimum. Minimum implies it's the smallest value on this whole interval, right? Um, in this case, minus infinity to infinity. Uh, when that is true, instead of just being a minimum on an, in a neighborhood, uh, which you know of as relative minimum or local minimum, but if it's the absolute minimum, then you can call it minimum. And I have this down here. You can call this um, minimum, absolute minimum, or absolute maximum, global minimum, global max on the interval, okay? Um, if it, if the, it just says minimum or maximum, it's implied that it's a, an absolute minimum or maximum. All right, so let's check out these functions below. Identify the maximum and minimum of each function on this interval. So the first interval is an open, it's uh, closed on the left and open on the right side. So let's just take a look. Um, I'm going to have my little hand tool here. Now you stop me when you see something interesting. Oh, okay. You you think that might be a potential, right? So let's just let's just say, okay, we're gonna we're gonna put a little order pair here, and then we'll come back and talk about these. So getting the hand back out again, and I go. Yep, that might be of interest. And then you probably found that this guy was of interest and maybe this guy down here. So let's talk about these things. The whole interval, if you were to write in, you know, some sort of an axis, right? Say, the whole interval goes from here to here, non-inclusive on that second one. So basically, these guys here they are interesting, right? But they are not absolute maxima, max, um, um, they are not representative of an absolute maximum or an absolute minimum, which is what you're asked to find here. The only absolute extremum is this guy here, right? So these two are relative extrema. So the only one that works for this one is going to be here. There is, this is the absolute maximum on this interval. Now down here, if this had been a closed interval, right, we would have had an absolute minimum. But do you see, you never reach if you're going, you know, along this way, right, on the x-axis, you're kind of inching this way if you trace the graph, right? You never reach this value. You can always get a number that's close to it, but not attaining it. So therefore, if you have, if your lowest point of the graph is an open circle, a non-inclusive part, then that does not represent an absolute extremum, okay? So in summary, the only one was right here for the first graph. Okay, so why don't you pause the movie and let's see what happens on this second graph. All right, let's see how you did. Now this time I'm not gonna label all these other things. Let's talk about, let's talk about um, if there is any absolute extremum. So my thought process here is that I'm thinking that this is the high point of the graph right here. So this guy here is the is the ordered pair where the um, I'm just going to say occurs here. So here we have an we have I'm just going to write it as minimum. Remember that's the same as absolute minimum. 
no, maximum. <laughs> maximum occurs here. And again, do you see that there is no minimum because the minimum would have been over on this point right at this point right here, but it's not included in the graph. So again, we only have a maximum and that it occurs right over there. Okay, so the extreme value theorem has And let me write that in just in case you go back. There's no minimum on either one of these. Okay, so this first theorem called the extreme value theorem, right, basically um, has the following. Um, statement. So if F is continuous on a closed interval from A to B, then F has both a minimum and a maximum on that closed interval, right? So let's take a look. Um, you know, if you have something along these lines, let's just say we have some random graph and here's X, here is F at X, right? And let's say that this is A and this is B. And suppose that our graph is here to here. Okay. Now, if you check this out, in order for this to be continuous, right, there can't be any breaks or jumps, right? So in order to get from this ordered pair to this ordered pair, tracing along the graph, right, you have to have a minimum and a maximum on this interval, right? Now, what if you had, what if you had something like this, right? And so let's write where our, where our, it looks like our maximum is about here, right? And our minimum is probably here. So what if we had a horizontal line or a horizontal line segment, right? Do you see that if this is A and this is B, then right here, F at A equals F at B. So this is one weird case where the minimum and maximum are the same. Okay? All right, so here we go. Definition of relative extrema. So if you have an open interval that contains a domain value C on which F at C is a maximum, right? Then F at C is called a relative maximum of F. Or you can say F has a relative max at the ordered pair C, F at C. And the same if you have an open interval containing C, where F at C is a minimum, then F at C is a relative minimum of F, or you can say F has a relative minimum at C, F at C. So basically, there's less conditions for relative extrema. They just need to be the, the um, largest Y value or smallest Y value in a certain neighborhood, if you will. All right. So let's take a look at um, let's take a look at again our warm up problem, right? Or this guy here. So with this one, do you see that 
there, this is the highest Y value on the interval from here to about, I don't know, here to about here, right? So basically, you could call this a relative maximum. Same here, a relative minimum right there. Um, on the second graph, you'd have a relative max here, a relative min here, right? Um, so basically, the what you have, um, that's how it, the difference between a relative max or min and just a max or min. So now, find the value of the derivative at the extremum 0, 1 for this function, right? So what do you think we should do with this guy? Okay, we can certainly differentiate, right, with respect to x. This is what most people go to do. Okay, so on the left side we'll get f prime at x is equal to, so the derivative of the cosine function is negative sine of that something times times d dx of that something, or something is pi x over 2. So now we will have f prime at x is equal to negative sine at pi x over 2 times, great, pi over 2. So, f prime of x, cleaning this up a bit, will be negative pi over 2 times sine at pi x over 2. Now, evaluating our derivative function at x is equal to 0, we will have negative pi over 2 times sine evaluated at pi times 0 over 2. So, all I did is I plugged in zero because that's what they asked us to do wherever there was an x in our derivative function. Now, f prime of zero will give us negative pi over two times sine at zero. But what is sine at zero? Great, zero. So we'll just get zero when we evaluate our derivative at this extremum. Now think about it. What's been happening at these these um, values where or these points where extrema occur. What do you notice here? Good. They end up having horizontal tangents, right? Um, often. So you could have potentially looked at this and used your knowledge of general trig functions to recognize, hey, I'm going to have a, a horizontal tangent line at this extremum value probably so therefore the value of the derivative should just be zero so either way this was the mechanical way of figuring it out but you could have looked at it in other ways as well um so again just a a quick graph we can go to our y equals and what was our function again cosine at pi x over two Oops. P 
pi x and then divide it by 2. And we can end our parentheses and delete the rest. Oops. There we go. All right, so we have cosine at pi x divided by 2. And um, we've got our derivative function set up. And so let's go to uh, zoom seven, which is trig. And we're actually interested in what occurs, you know, at zero one, right? So let's kind of zoom box over here around what's going on with these guys. Whoops. So there's zero, one right there. And there's our derivative function. So as you can see, This guy here is our f at x equals cosine at pi x over 2. And then this other, this other guy here was our f prime of x was equal to negative pi over 2 times sine at pi x over 2. And um, at this extremum value right here, right? Do you see? There's a there there would be a horizontal tangent line for the graph, and as you can see on our our derivative graph right here, do you see that the derivative has an output of zero, right? All right, so pretty cool stuff, huh? All right, so um, definition of a critical number. So, pay attention to this because more gets sort of added in um, later on uh, in 3.3. But for now, we'll use definition of a critical number um, means that f has to be defined at this input value c. In order to have a critical number, you can't have a, um, an, a hole in the graph at the input value c. So if f prime at c is 0 or if f is not differentiable at c but exists at c, then c is a critical number. So let's take a look at example 2. Does this one look familiar? <laughs> of course it does. We just did this, right? Do you remember that we got f prime of x was equal to 4x minus 8, right, from the warm-up? And so when we, when we set f prime equal to zero and solved, we ended up with x equal to two, okay? So basically, what does this mean? This means that x is two. We got this two by finding the zeros of the derivative, right? This is, this, uh, is a quadratic function, so it's domain is all real numbers, so it's differentiable everywhere, so the second condition doesn't apply. So basically, our critical number, C, is 2. Okay, so far? Awesome. All right, what about this guy? Well, what do you think we do? Beautiful, you find the zeros of the, uh-oh, sorry. You find the zeros of the derivative. 
on this interval. So let's check it out. G prime at X is going to equal to, so remember that chain rule, 2 times something to the 1 power, or something, is sine at X, and then we want to find the derivative with respect to X of that something, sine at X. And then don't forget that we still have to take care of the minus sine at X. So the derivative of sine at X is good, cosine at X. Good so far? Awesome. Alrighty, so now continuing, we'll have G prime at X is 2 times sine at X. The derivative with respect to X of sine at X is cosine at X, and then we'll be subtracting a cosine at X. Now, we can certainly factor, well actually, so this here, right here, is our derivative, and now we want to find the zeros of the derivative for to find our critical number. So if I factor out a cosine at X, I'll be left with 2 times sine at X minus 1, so we'll get cosine at x is 0, or 2 times sine at x minus 1 is 0. So on the interval from 0 inclusive to 2 pi non-inclusive, on that interval, what angle yields a value of 0 for the cosine function? Beautiful. On the first one, x could take on a value of pi over 2 or 3 pi over 2. This guy if we isolate sine at x, we're going to get 1 half. The sine function is positive in which two quadrants? Perfect. Quadrants 1 and 2. And it's got the uh, 30, 60, 90 degree triangle has a shorter height when you have a reference angle of 30 degrees or good, pi over 6. Beautiful. So we'll get x would be pi over 6, or x could be 5 pi over 6. So what have we found? Our critical numbers are c1 is pi over 2, c2 is, I won't order them, we'll have 3 pi over 2, c3 is pi over 6, and c4 is 5 pi over 6. And we're done. Good so far? Awesome. So in summary, when you find the zeros of the derivative, you have found the critical numbers. Keep in mind, we did not come across this second case where f is not differentiable at c yet. Okay? So, um, just keep that in mind. You always have to be thinking about that as well. Okay, so let's take a look at, at part C. Again, we want to find the derivative now with respect to t because we have a function of t. So we will have on the left s prime at t. And on the right, remember the quotient rule. So we'll have d dt of 3t times t squared minus 4 minus 3t times the derivative with respect to t of t squared minus 4 all over t squared minus 4 the quantity squared. Good so far? Awesome. Right? So s prime at t is 3 times t squared minus 4 minus 3t times, perfect, 2t minus 0 is just 2t, all over t squared minus 4, the quantity squared. Simplifying, we will have 3t squared minus 12 minus 6t squared all over 
t squared minus 4 the quantity squared, which gives us, let's see, I think we'll have a negative 3t squared minus 12 over t squared minus 4, that quantity squared. So now, if I set s prime equal to 0 and solve, keep in mind you need only equate the numerator equal to 0 um, because that will zero out the whole fraction unless you ended up with 0 over 0, um, which we won't. So here what happens, well, we would get 12 is negative 3t squared. Negative 4 is t squared. Now, if you solve this, what do you get? If you square root both sides, we would get t is plus or minus 2i, right? Because that's imaginary. So this is not real. So no, no critical number. found by equating s prime at t equal to zero. So now we have to think about, okay, is there a function on the graph where, um, or a function, is there, is there an input value on this graph where the function exists, right, but that the, but the, it's not differentiable. Well, the only problem children here, right, are going to be when you are at t is plus or minus 2, but t equal to plus or minus 2 represent, represent the vertical asymptotes, and they don't exist on the graph. So it turns out that this guy has no critical numbers. And that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Um, that's your answer to this guy. Uh, you still, you know, have stuff you can test out, but um, it's, it's not going to have critical numbers. So let's see what this looks like, right? So what was this? It was uh, 3t over t squared minus 4. So let's go to our y equals and we have three. I'm just going to use x's um, just for expedience sake. So 3t over t squared. So we're using x squared minus 4. And I needed to put parentheses around that. All right, and then we'll get our derivative graph as well. Let's see what we have. Well, this one doesn't give us a super great picture, so let's zoom standard. So there's our graph, and take a look at the derivative. Pretty cool, huh? So notice that there's no horizontal tangent lines on this graph. So if we just take a look and let's get our picture going. Oops. All right. So what's happening here is you've got, um, again, you know, this is our regular function, and it was uh, s at t, so this is a t, and this is s at t, um, is equal to 3t over t squared minus 4. Here's, you know, our, our uh, at x is plus or minus 2, we have our 
vertical asymptotes for our graph and um, our derivative our derivative function you know um, here notice that it never crosses the x-axis so there's no real zeros just as we found right so the green again is our s prime of t and that was equal to um, negative 3t squared minus 12 over t squared minus 4 the quantity squared right okay so um, next up we have a theorem that, that tells us that relative extrema occur only at critical numbers. So this is a um, you know, pretty cool little theorem, useful theorem, and it helps us to prove um, something called the, the uh, intermediate value theorem as well as other stuff, right? So um, basically what this tells us is rel you know, relative extrema can only occur when the derivative is zero or when the function is not differentiable at a certain value of c okay all right so guidelines for finding extrema which remember is also known as absolute extrema or global extrema on a closed interval so first find the critical numbers right that's where you might have a turning point in the graph evaluate the original function at each critical number and this is in the open interval not including the endpoints because we evaluate the endpoints on the next step, right? And then the biggest number is the maximum. The smallest number is the minimum, okay? So let's check this guy out and see, and see what we get, right? All right, so we will have f prime let's see so find the critical numbers the first step is find the critical numbers on the open interval from negative pi to pi so f prime at x is going to be equal to three times good negative sine at x so f prime at x is negative three times sine at x right so to find the critical numbers, what do I do? Good, I set the derivative equal to zero and solve. So we'll have x, and I'm thinking of these intervals, right? The open interval. I better figure out what's going on with my slide here. that fixed it good okay so now we have our x is um, going to be equal to from negative pi to pi we would just be at zero because it's on the open interval so our critical number is c is zero now we evaluate it f f at zero right our critical number and that would be three times cosine at zero which is good just three and then evaluate the function at the end points So the endpoint, so f at negative pi, again, we're using the original function, is 3 times cosine at negative pi, which is 3 times negative cosine at pi using the negative angle identity. No. Which is equivalent to go down here, which is equivalent to 
3 times cosine of pi since the cosine function is even, which will be 3 times negative 1, which is negative 3. And f at pi is equal to 3 times cosine at pi, which we just found was negative 3. So what is our conclusion? Right? Our conclusion would be there's a, or actually not there is, the minimum is negative 3, and it occurs in two spots, right? At negative pi negative 3 and pi negative 3. The maximum is positive 3 and occurs at 0, 3. And we're done. Okay, how'd you do? Awesome. All right, so now back over here. So now we're looking on just this specific interval. Oh, I'm sorry, let's do our graph. What the heck? So if we have this as x and f at x, right? And we can see our information. Um, and let's just say that we have negative pi and pi and one, two, three, negative 1, negative 2, and negative 3. So our, our function looks like what? We already found some order pairs, didn't we? So at negative pi, aren't we at negative 3, right? And at pi, I think we're also at negative 3. And at 0, we're at 3. If you wanted to get a couple more ordered pairs, notice that we'll zero out at negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So it's going to have just a kind of a slight curvature. Actually, I don't like the second half of that. There we go. Much more better. All right. And then um, our derivative function, on the other hand, is going to be, what did we get? We got negative 3 sine at x. So we'd have an ordered pair at 0, 0, right? And then we'd have, uh, it, it zeroes out here and here, right, for the derivative. And then at pi over 2, we'd be at negative 3. And at negative pi over 2, we would be at positive 3. So that's what our sine function would look like. Okay? Um, I'm sorry, our, our, this is our derivative function on that interval. So this is uh, f prime of x. And the blue is f at x. Okay? And notice, you know, we have a horizontal tangent at the zeros of the first derivative. So this guy is going to be uh, t and g at t. So um, I don't know. Why don't we have it be 5, negative 5, and then same over here. And so we're only interested in that one interval from 3 to 5 inclusive. So um, just plotting some points. And actually, can't we do part of our deal here? 
if we're evaluating the function at the endpoints, right, g at 3 is going to be 3 over 3 minus 2, which is 1, right? And then g at 5 is going to be 5 over 5 minus 2, which is 5 thirds. So if we plot those points, what did we get? 3, 1. And then we got um, 5, 5 thirds. So that's what? 1 and 2 thirds. So 1 and 2 thirds is about here, right? Um, so, so, you know, if you need more of a flavor of the graph, um, it's going to also have an ordered pair at, at what, zero, zero, I believe. Yes, at zero, zero, and then at one, ne one negative, is it one negative one? So one over one minus two, so one. Oh, that's right, because we'll have the asymptote. So basically, you know what? Don't worry about that. At at uh, t is 2, we would have our vertical, our vertical asymptote, because that's where the denominator is 0. So do you see that this would be heading down towards, down, down like this? So the graph, you know, would look like this. And the interval that we're interested in, of course, is just uh, these guys, okay? So notice that we have something that is differentiable on that interval, right? And, um, and uh, so let's find our critical numbers, and we'll just uh, find them by setting the derivative equal to zero and solving, because that's the only way that we'll get a critical number. So the derivative of the numerator is 1, and then we multiply that to the denominator minus the numerator times derivative of the denominator, which will also be 1, over the denominator squared. So g prime at t will be t minus 2 minus t over t minus 2 quantity squared. So look what happens. The t is 0 out. So we get g prime at t is negative 2 over t minus 2 the quantity squared. So is negative 2 ever 0? No, right? So this has um, no critical numbers. Okay? So that takes one of the steps away, right? Uh, because we were looking for critical numbers on that open interval, 3 to 5, but there weren't any. So that means we don't need this one, right? So this guy um, is not applicable. So what we have found, you know, the lowest, the, the lowest value, right? The minimum is 1 at the ordered pair, 3, 1. The maximum is 5 thirds, and that occurred at 5 comma 5 thirds. Okay, so that's the conclusion for this guy. And um, so the next one is our last problem. So... Don't get too excited. <laughs> All right, so here we go. This is an application. You've got a real retailer. They've determined that the cost of ordering and storing X units of product is C equals 2X plus 300,000 over X. Um, and X is between 1 and 300 inclusive. So the delivery, trick tri ah, delivery truck can bring at most 300 units per order. So here we go. We need to find, if we just call this c at x is 2x plus, and we can write this in an easier way to deal with, right? 300,000 times x to the minus 1. So if I differentiate both sides with respect to x, we will have, let's see, c 
prime at x on the left side, and then we'll have, uh, let's see, we'll have a 2 plus 300,000 times negative 1 times our something to the negative 2, right? And um, actually, our something is just x. I'm making it harder than it is. <laughs> so we'll have negative 1 times x to the negative 2, right? And so C prime of x is 2 minus 300,000 over x squared. So finding the zeros of this, we'll have 0 is 2 minus 300,000 over x squared, which gives us 300,000 over x squared is 2. So then we'll have 2x squared is 300,000. And continuing, we'll get x squared is 150,000. So uh, we'll just consider the positive root since you can't have a negative amount of items in the order. So x would be the square root of 150,000. And what is that approximately? We'll round. Um, we'll round uh, down, I guess, since we don't want a partial unit. So, so let's see, we had square root of 150,000. And let's see, that's 387.387. 387 so we'll just say that, that C is going to be 387. But check this out. I mean, our interval goes from 1. 1 is less than or equal to X is less than or equal to 300. So do you see that our critical number is not in our interval, right? So let's, let's continue and find out what we would get um, you know, evaluating the endpoints. So over here, come up here, C at 1 is going to be, uh, let's see, 2 plus 300,000 over 1, which is 300,000, which is 300,002. And then C at 300 is the other endpoint. And that's going to be 2 times 300 is 600 plus 300,000 over 300. And so that's going to equal to 1,600. So with this truck, what is our conclusion? Our conclusion would be the max order. or the, I'm sorry, the order size that minimizes cost is 300. Okay, so that's the answer for the first part. But let's check this out, guys. Could the cost be decreased if we use a truck that could bring 400 units? So what else would we have to evaluate? Good, C at 400, we have the other information. So this would be two times 400, and then that would be plus 300,000 divided by 400. And let's see what we get approximately for that calculator out. So that would be let's see 800 plus 300,000 divided by 400 which gives us 1550. 
So now what we need to compare is this amount and C evaluated at the critical number from before, which was 387. So C at 387 is approximately, I'll just go back to the calculator here. So um, if I hit second entry, I can do um, change this guy to 387. And this would be over here. This would be two times three, and I'll insert the other ones, 87. Whoops. Insert two times 387. Okay, and that gives us 1549. So at the end of the day, uh, by one dollar, <laughs> Um, the minimum cost is $1,549 and occurs with an order of 387 items. Okay, so go have yourself a margarita. <laughs> You've done enough thinking for today. Um, and I will uh, be talking to you soon. All right, have a fabulous day. Bye. Just around.